So you have to be within 0.5 of the supposed limit. All right. So that's, that sets this up. So given an epsilon, so this is definite, you can set this up. What was f of x? We don't know. Here's the graph of it. So they already graphed it for me, so I, I don't even know, need to know what the hell it is. Are you guys kind of with me? I'm trying to make the connection between this one and the one that somebody actually asked me about. Whoever asked me is like, I didn't ask them. Uh, then I see where it intersects, what outputs. I, I, I've got to be within this much of the limit. And then I'm trying to figure out, well, what? how close to 3 do I have to be? What's my delta then going to have to be? This is beautiful. This is the visual of the whole idea. And it's really simple. How close do I have to be to my input so that my outputs are within 0.5 away from the supposed limit? Okay. Number six, you do this yourself. You create this yourself. So I'm going to show you how to create this. Okay. Let me see. Maybe it's easier if I Let's see if that's a true statement. I've okay, got brewing in my head or not. Ooh, nice. Okay. So let me see. Let's do number five. Just to show an example like the one I assigned. What is f of x? If you have your book, you can kind of re relate this to what they did. Where they had f of x, we actually have a function, right? They, they have to tell me it because I have to graph the damn thing. What is f of x? Tangent x. That's f of x. What's the supposed limit? One. So f of x is tangent x. Let me put tangent x here. Tangent x. Yay. So I'm going to graph tangent x. I also want to graph... Bring this back into play. I want to graph these constants. Damn, my fingers are huge. Wow. I want to graph these constants and I might as well graph this guy too. And then I want to see where they hit. Where do they hit the function? What are the x values where they intersect? That's really breaking down what this picture was made for me. That's why this one's so easy. Now we're going to try to make it ourselves. We're going to graph the tangent function. It's going to be in place of the blue. I'm also going to go within one as much as I'm supposed to. And how, how much within one do I want to be? How close to one do I want to be? Point two. Point two. That's their given epsilon. Are you guys with me? Okay. So then I want to go from. So what are my what are my values going to be instead of two point five two and one point five? Mine are going to be one point two one and point eight. One minus point two. I want to be within point two of one. So let me do all that. So I'm going to do. 1.2, 1, 1 and 0.8. So I've got all the, I've got the blue function that's going to be tangent. I've got the, the three lines like this. To be honest, I don't really need this line, but just to make it look just like that, I will. And then I just need to figure out where does this line intersect here? Where does this line intersect here? That'll be my x values here. Now, on this problem, what would delta be? What's delta going to be for this problem? How close do I have to be to make sure that this actually happens? If I thought it was 0.8, that sucks, because then 0.8 from here will be down here. Oh, shit, I'm not in there anymore. So I've always got to pick the smaller one to be more conservative, because 0.8 works over there, so of course 0.4 is going to work over there. Shit, that really makes it in there. So you always take the smaller one. I like it. So really, number six is just recreating this picture yourself and then doing the same damn thing to the problem. So let's go back. Let's see what we got so far. I'm going to talk a letter. If I graph this stuff, you get a good window. See how I'm only interested in, let's see if I can get a decent window. 
I'm around pi over 4. Right? So I can do like, you know, 0 to pi over 2. But let's just do negative 1 to, uh, to 2. You guys kind of see where I'm getting that from? Negative 1 to 2. And then my output's going to be around 1, so I don't need to go nearly. So I can go negative 1 to 2 again. Why not? Let's see what this looks like. Graph. There's my function, the tangent. There's the top line. There's the, the limit line. And there's the bottom line just the same way as this. Now, do you see, everybody see how I got what I needed to put into the calculator just to get here? Now, how do I determine these damn things? Holy shit. Has anybody ever done finding the intersection of two things on the calculator? Yeah, it's amazing what you do. Uh, everything on the top row in the calculator is related to graphing. What do I want to do with my graph right now? I want to calculate something from my graph. So not surprisingly, I want to go to calc. It's on the top row. So if you go to calc, what looks like what I want to do? Yeah, number five. And then it's going to ask you three questions. What is your question? No, it's going to ask you. So I want to figure out what the hell this x value is. So I'm going to do that first. And then I want to figure out what the hell this x value is. Cool. And this one I just put in there just because that's going to be the, that's pi over 4 right there going to its output. So if you go, the first curve, the funny thing is, well, let's see. Here's the first curve in blue. And then the second curve is going to be in pink. And then my guess, I'm pretty much at my guess. So there's the intersection. 0.67471, right? If you ever round for this, you, all, you kind of round down, because delta, you always want to be more conservative. Does that sort of make sense? Maybe a little bit? Okay. Now do the same thing for this one. And then all you're really doing is you're making, you're figuring out those. I'm just, I just figured out that number. Now go do the, do the intersection for the other side, figure out that number, see which one's closer, and that one to be your delta, that difference. Same exact way you do this problem. It's just on this problem, they graphed it for you. On that problem, they're like, we're tired. You do the graph. Maybe? Yes? Are you expecting like a lot of work to be shown for these problems if you like do it on a calculator like that? Uh, for this one, I would just want, you don't even have to sketch it out, but I, I would want this. Okay. And, and show me how you chose what delta was. Yeah. You don't have to like redraw the whole thing out. Is that is that is that decent right there? Okay. So those would be like for numbers two point six and three point eight would be the answers. No, 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 no. Um, the question on this one is, what does delta have to be? So how do I stay in here? Well, up to three point eight keeps me in here, right? Mm -hmm. So point eight away, but point eight away would be too far down. So I better just go point four away. Delta would be 0.4. How close to 3 do I have to be to be sure that the outputs from there would stay in here? I have to be 0.4 away. Okay. And to be honest, anything you know less than 0.4 is valid too. So for like number 5 or number 6, the x values that we get in the calculator, that's the answer for those? Well, that'll be questions. those, and then you, and you compare it to see how far away, which one's uh, closer to pi over 4. Because okay. pi over 4 is your uh, x value for that one, right? Okay. Uh, let's see, here it is. Am I seeing it? Jeff, just look at the book. I don't want to. Right. See, pi over 4 is your x value, mm -hmm. right? And then, so delta is going to be whichever one's closer to that, that distance from the number you find from the intersection thing we just did, the distance from that to pi over 4. Whichever okay. one's closer, that's the delta you use. If you use the other one, then the other side's going to be too far out. It's not going to be in that little containment place. Okay. 
Okay. I like it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else from homework I can confuse you about? Or hopefully the opposite of that. Oh, what's up? Oh, okay. Anything else from homework? No. You guys are all doing the homework, right? I'll get them graded. I wanted to have them graded, but this morning just didn't happen the way I wanted it to. We got our test coming up Thursday, so tomorrow I'm going to have a practice test. Uh, and then the next day I'll have an answer key to it. Yes? So by Thursday we have to hand in all the way to the three points, right? Yeah, it'll, we'll see how far if we make it that far. We'll see. I, I don't think we shouldn't make it that far, but we'll see. So by Wednesday we'll know for sure what's going to be in that test. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no more questions, we get right back into where we left off. I think we finished all these. We, we definitely got into chapter three. We learned our first, we learned a couple differentiation rules so far, if I'm right. We did um, the power rule, right? We did. Um, She showed you the one for sine and cosine. So let's kind of refresh what we know here. Um, these are the ones we know so far. If this, then f no, f prime is going to be what? The n times x to the n minus one. It's kind of nifty. So that n comes down, and it goes down by a power. And we proved why that is. It's a beautiful, easy rule. But we actually use the definition of derivative to prove this. So don't forget that. It's not just something we pick because it's easy. It's just the way it happens. Um, we also know... Uh, the, the, the basic stuff for sine and cosine. So, what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. And what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Negative sine. I like that. By the way, I think I told you guys about the cosine as an asshole. Here's another example of cosine being an asshole. Yes, no, maybe so. Whatever you want to say, Jeff. Whatever, Jeff. Say your shit. All right. Um, and then we also learned a, a broader rule. It's not function specific. It just says if I have the product of two functions, it tells me how to do the overall derivative of that whole thing. So if uh, h of x is f of x times g of x, and then h prime of x, how does it work? Yeah. They each take a turn. F gets a turn, sure, and G's got to just sit there, and then G goes, now you sit there, and it's my turn. Nah, nah. I love it. I love it. Cool. I like it. Now, uh, we the last thing we did was actually the, the product rule, so we want to look at the we have this idea of the quotient rule coming up. Um, but I wanted to do things a little bit a little bit out of order. Just because a quotient rule, you could go through all the little uh, uh, details and uh, uh, rewriting of how things work and so forth. But <coughs> once you know what's called the chain rule and you go back, the quotient rule is just stupid simple. And it makes it easy to remember also. You don't have to make a little song about it. I don't know if anybody knows the little quotient rule song. My song goes like this. Top first, and that's it. That's my song. 
we'll see why that makes sense. Uh, hopefully, why it makes sense. So these are all the things we know for sure so far. Derivative rules. So let's talk about this idea of a chain rule. So just to remind you guys, y prime is dy dx. So what would like uh, let me let me let me get the notation going because that's the notation is going to be huge on this. Uh, we're going to look at this chain rule. Uh, what if I had S prime of T? How would you write that in that notation there? DS dt. I like it. Right? Uh, and so forth. I mean, that prime hides a little bit of information, but you can kind of tease out what it is. Now, later, this notation is much more important when there are multiple variables in a single function, right? Here, we're talking about single variable functions, thank God. And there's really no ambiguity, to be honest. But this just puts it right in your face what the units are, what you're taking the derivative with respect to, so forth. I like it. Let me, let me get your take on something here. So, yeah. What if I had, what if I function, let me see if you guys can get this. Uh, okay, so what if I have this, so you guys can get this idea. This is different. This is not sine of x. This is sine of 3x. So when I'm trying to think about what the derivative of this is going to be, something has to be different. It can't just be cosine of 3x, and the 3 doesn't do anything, right? Uh, in fact, think about it. What does the derivative tell me? What does the derivative tell me about a function? What, what, what's um, slope? And what's another way to reference slope? A lot more words, uh, or not a lot more words, three words. Middle word is of. Rate of change. Rate of change. Um, so it has to do something with how quickly this goes through its outputs. Stay with me now. This is kind of cool. I'm, I'm making something new on the fly here. Something that I thought about a second ago. Um, but that's it. That, this is the real way to look at this. It talks about how quickly it goes through its outputs. So for example, real quick, a uh, little side note. If uh, which one of these... Let's say after a value of one, which one of these goes qu more quickly through its outputs? What does that mean by that? I mean, which one rises faster? Yeah, this one does, right? And its derivative kind of shows you that. Uh, it, what's this guy's derivative? 2x. Two two and what's this guy's derivative? 3x three three squared. Yeah, so if I put a 2 in, this is going uh, at a rate of 4 units up for every unit over. Is that cool? But this was at, at two, this would be going at a, a rate of 12 units up for every unit over. How's everybody doing so far? And I, I, I really want to hammer home all the different ways of looking at slope and derivative and the same thing, but all the ways you can look at a slope is the same ways you can look at derivative. Okay. Can somebody remind me? Okay, this is the one you're going to really like, this question. What does that three do? to the graph of sine. Careful. Remember, when it's in with the x, it's the opposite of what it looks like. Because all my inputs have to now be one-third as big as they used to, because what's the first thing I do to them? Multiply them by three. So what you said is right. I think you said that compresses. But why does it make sense? All the inputs have to be one-third as big as they used to be. Right? It does the opposite. Of, it doesn't get three times bigger. It gets one third in the x direction. You guys with me? So doesn't this get through its outputs faster than sine does? Yeah. In fact, how much faster does it get through its outputs? Exactly. Three, three times faster. Oh shit. So this, the derivative of this, 
should involve a multiplication of three. It just should. If we thought the derivative of this was just cosine three X, that doesn't make sense. There should be something more there, right? It should be three times as fast. It should, I don't know if you guys really follow what I'm saying. So just understanding that when the inside function is more involved than just x, there's something extra we have to do. And to be honest, we already do this. I'll go back and show you that. Once we learn this rule, it's got to work for everything, including the x squared and the x cubed that we already know. Okay. So I just want that idea up there. We'll come back to it. So if I look at things with this, now, now watch. Let me, let me rewrite this. Let me see what you guys think about this. And of course, all my, all my poor little markers are dying. Are you dead? Yeah, pretty much. Go ahead. So let me see what you guys think. What's df d3x? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. You guys can do this. So dy dx is taking that respect to x by itself. This is saying take the respect to 3x. Like 3x is its own thing. So that would just be cosine 3x. Done. What's the derivative of sine x? What's the derivative with respect to x? Sine x. Cosine x. So what's the derivative with respect to y of sine y? Cosine y. So what's the derivative with respect to 3x sine 3x? Cosine 3x. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, some of you guys are like, that's what you just told us it isn't. But I'm not taking respect to x, am I? I'm doing respect to 3x. This is a really useful thing to learn right now also, because once you get, if anybody's taking 280, especially 281 in your future, if you have that in the future, and somebody here's like, oh, no, thank you. I understand. But if you do, understanding this will help a lot with that in the future. Uh, this is just cosine 3x. Now, I want df dx, right? That's what I want. I want to figure out what, how do you take the derivative of that with respect to x just by itself? I don't want some, you know, I can't always just do this and go, oh yeah, there's weird shit inside. Let me just take it with respect to that. No, I need to be able to take it through with respect to x. And you know how quickly that function is moving with respect to other functions so I can compare them. Now watch. We already know how to do this. df d3x. What I want is df over dx. What, what would I multiply this by so that it becomes df over dx? You can do it. You can do it. Do it. What would I multiply four fifths by so that it becomes four over seven? I would multiply by five over seven. Get rid of the shit I don't want and replace it with the shit I want. Let me let that sink in. Now, they, they, they show you in the book. I'm not going to just regurgitate the book at you. Right? If you want the real technical proof, you can go to the book. You can look at the, the proof. I'm trying to show you why this makes sense just working with something directly. Now, now what I just did, I could do no matter what this is, right? And no matter what this is, really. So I have, I have a function. And real quick, let's just let's just do this concrete thing right now. What was this again? And let me call this what I'm going to call this. And then we got to do this. And this is going to be easy. This is the derivative of the outside function. And then the inside has to get a turn. I love this whole idea of giving things a turn. So when it's a product. You give them each a term, but you add the things together. 
when it's a composition, when one's inside of the other one, it's called the chain rule. And the reason it's called the chain rule is that you link the other derivatives onto a multiplication. It makes a chain of stuff. So what's d 3 x dx? What's the derivative of 3x with respect to x? 3. So isn't that exactly what we were saying earlier, that it should be 3 times as fast? Yes. So uh, more generally, if I have a function with another <coughs> function inside, don't say that, Ellen. <laughs> function with another function inside. There's a reason I'm calling this u, by the way. There's a whole thing called u sub, we'll learn later. I mean, there's u sub. Um, yeah, some of you guys are catching up with what I said uh, If I want df dx, this would be df du, derivative of the function with respect to that whole thing, just like the 3x was u. Whatever the shit's inside, I just pretend like it's not anything. I just pretend like it's only sine of x. I just pretend like that for a second. But then the inside's got to get a turn. And, and this is kind of insane to believe, to, to, to see. These do cancel. These are, um, it's too bad you guys, there's no room for like the history of math for, in some of these courses, but these are what's called infinitesimals. So this is kind of like, how much does F move, given an infinitesimal movement in the U direction? That's really what this is. Because again, what does calculus do? It finds the instantaneous rate of change. So to be honest, we didn't move at all. But we do that by moving such a small amount. In fact, it's a limiting, it's limiting to zero. We don't move at all, is, is the limit. Yeah? I was just asking, um, so when I said you put D of F with respect to D of U, is it supposed to be d of f with respect to d u of x? Because the u of x is inside the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the of x. Yeah. I mean, this is also... The of x I don't have to write down if I don't want to. It, it wouldn't change anything if I did that. So okay. It means the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Just for the sake of having less to write. So it is the u is the function of x, whatever u is. Is that cool? I'm not putting f of u up here either. And we know that f is referring to that function. Cool, I like it. Let's try some problems out. I want you to see how this works. And the big mistake people make is they'll always ask me when I do chain rule, when they get really into it, you're like, how do I know when to stop? And when people ask me that question, I understand that they don't understand how to do it. There's no ambiguity and you're like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about right now. What do you mean when to stop? Let's work our way up to it. Start off nice. Um, Oh yeah, there was one I left off, a rule I left off that we know. What's the nicest rule we know so far? What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Shit yeah. So let's do this. What if it was e to the uh, cosine x? It's kind of a nifty function if you graph. What would f prime of x be? So here's what you do. Here's how chain rule works. It says take the derivative of this function as if this was just x. What is the derivative of e to the x? Itself. So it's e to the cosine x. That's, that's what it is so far. That's e's turn. That's, what would you say the outside function is, e? What's the inside function? Cosine. The inside one is the one I'm going to do next. So what's e to something? It's, it's e to that thing. And now that thing gets a turn. Yeah, so then I get e to the, so what's the derivative of cosine? Negative, Negative sine x, e to the cosine x. That's the derivative of that function. That's chain rule. Everything we've done before today, if you look back, they all had x as the inside function. And, and just to, not to really blow your mind, but just to point this out, we've already been using chain rule the whole time. What's the, if, if, if uh, y is x squared, what's y prime? Yeah, something squared is twice that thing to one power. And what's the inside function? x. 
But what's x prime? One. One. Right, so if the inside function is just x, why even do that shit? It's just going to be one. So it's only the inside function is more than just x. It's 2x or x squared plus 7 or cosine of x or whatever. How are we doing? Okay, okay. I like it. Um, all right, so let's do one. A real chain rule one. Here we go. And here's what I mean by when do I stop. Um, uh, I'll tell you what. Sorry. Let's just do this one. So you start to get the Russian nesting doll idea of functions. You guys know what Russian, the Russian nesting dolls are? The bigger one inside of the bigger one inside of the bigger one. So you got a function inside of a function inside of a So how do you handle anything that requires use of a rule? You write the form of the rule and then you take derivatives. This is what's going to keep you straight. So like here, y prime, what's the form of the rule? The rule is take the derivative of the outside function times the derivative of the inside. So what is the derivative of sine? Cosine of, and then all this stuff stays the same, times the derivative. Now what's the inside function for this? Cosine of sine. Let me stop it for a second. See, what I mean is people try to write it all the way out, and they go insane, like, when do I stop? But no, you, you don't try from the very beginning to write all the links down for the chain rule. You don't write all the links down. You write that next link. Now, what's this going to involve? Does it have an inside function? Yeah. Yes, it does. So it's going to involve a chain rule itself. So I get cosine of cosine of sine times, how do I take the, this guy's derivative? Sine of sine x times? Yeah, times the derivative of the, let me go ahead and write this out, times the derivative of the inside. Now, does this need a chain rule? No. There's no inside function here, right? So that's when you know you're done, when you don't have to apply the chain rule anymore, you're obviously done. All right, so now I can write out cosine, cosine, sine x times sine of sine x times cosine x. Holy shit. Yes? Uh, isn't the second sine and the second line just negative? Negative, thank you. I knew somewhere there was something. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Negative sine. We'll just put that negative, it's all time, so we'll just put it negative way up there. Cool. Is that cosine being an asshole? So now let me show you. Uh, Let's, let's take a step back. Now that we've sort of seen chain rule, I'm not going to say that we understand it yet, because we've got to do something to really get it down. Let's go back to investigate what a quotient would do. And I'm going to do, remind me, what is the product rule? Product rule says what? Yeah, so f prime, g, let me just write like this, f g prime, right? Okay, now watch. To be honest, when I took calc 1, I never directly used quotient rule. Now I sort of do, now I'm okay with that. And I'll show you what I mean. Every quotient can be written as a product where the bottom is to a negative 1 power. Now let me show you how to do that first, and then I'm going to show you the full quotient rule form, which I highly recommend you use, by the way. Don't be like Jeff. Um, 
So what I mean is if I have something like this, can't I write that as And now I could use a combination of product and chain. Just, just go with me for a minute. I really dislike the foolproof quotient rule. It's just disgusting to look at. But watch this. So H prime, I have this times this. So the product rule is the main thing happening. Now within that, there's going to be a chain rule, because there's a function inside of another function. You guys see that? G is the inside function, negative one power is the outside function. So it's gonna be F prime, and all this other shit's just sitting here waiting, plus F times, let me see, what happens, let me just write this out all the way. Okay, there's the product rule, right? That's just the product rule. Is that cool? The derivative of f times the other stuff plus f times the derivative of this stuff. So, excited. so now watch. This is going to be, let me just write this as f prime over g of x. Is that cool? Because it's to a negative one power, isn't it? Okay, okay. Plus f of x. Now, how do I do this guy's derivative? Something to the negative one power. The negative one is the outside function. You guys agree? Because it's outside. So then I take its derivative first, and then I multiply by the inside. So how do I take the derivative of something to the negative one power? What happens? Something to the negative one power. The power comes down. And now it's to the the two power times what's the inside function? G of x. So I take its derivative. Some of you guys are like, you like this one better or what the other one look like? Trust me. No. This isn't that bad. Let me let me bring it up here, because otherwise I'm gonna start to get too low here. So then I get, that's so h prime is f prime over g. Now watch this. This is going to be minus f g prime, right? Where do we go? Over g of x squared. Do you guys see that? Just rewriting it. Is that cool? I can take that, those two g of x's down. It's negative, so I'm going to just put the minus there. F and g prime up on top. Is it ready? All right. I lost you. Let me know where. All right. We're doing everything that we, we, we know. I know that I haven't told you what the functions are, and the reason is I just want you to realize this is the rule. It doesn't matter what the hell the functions are. So I used product rule here. This derivative required a chain rule, and now I just rewrote in a better form. How would I combine these two? These are just two fractions. How do I combine fractions? So who's missing what? Yeah, this first guy is missing a, a G. Don't square, don't square, please, dear God. You're not allowed to square top and bottom, or else two-thirds would equal four-ninths in the world would go down the flinch. You multiply this guy by another g of x, right? So then I end up with this. f prime g minus f g prime. That almost looks very familiar, doesn't it? That almost looks like product rule right now. So you guys, I love the ones that said quotient rule. Yes, this is quotient rule. But the top here looks like power rule, except there's a minus. And then the bottom is just going to be g of x, the square of that. So, but look why this makes sense. Of course that's a minus, because what did I take the derivative of here in this step? Here's the f prime. 
I took the derivative of g, but where was g? On the freaking bottom. So of course it's going to be minus because that negative power would have come down. So division is multiplication. So there should be a connection between the product rule and the quotient rule because division is freaking multiplication, right? Multiplication by the inverse. There is no division. Now, why is there a couple of these on there? Because there's, just to get the LCD going, right? But this is beautiful. So the really, you just realize it's almost product rule except it's minus. Why does it make so much sense there's a minus here? Because one of the functions is on the bottom. It's got a negative power. And so this is my, my, my song is top first. What do I take the derivative of first? Which way does this go is really the important part that students forget. So just remember, top first, if you want to make it a horrible song. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so essentially you're saying that sometimes it's more efficient to use product rule over... Uh, so when I was uh, when you can apply both a young, foolish problem. man, I... I I always used uh, product rule. I always brought whatever's on the bottom yeah. up. Now, sometimes the common denominator gets a little disgusting between the two things. So you yeah. have to live with the fact that if you do it that way, you are eventually probably going to have to find an LCD and get everything together. Yeah, Whereas if you do it this way, it's sort of a shortcut. It's already been gotten together for you. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, it's a little give and take between the two. Not a damn thing wrong with only ever using product rule, bringing the bottom up, making it to a negative one power, but it does sometimes cause a little extra work part of the way down, depending on what you have to do next. So essentially it's just personal preference and sometimes one's better than another? Yes. Yes. How do you tell when? Well, you, you should probably try to use both and try to get a feel for that yourself. I mean, it's all about making math your own thing. Why does it make sense? Is there a better way to do it? What makes more sense to me? All that should go, should go into how you do things. Right. All right. Let, let's let's try a couple using the full quotient rule, just to see how it kind of comes together. So that's what you need to memorize. And there's some dumbass song about high, low, lady high stuff. And it's almost sacrilegious that I dare say that, call it dumbass, but it is. It's unnecessary. And again, the more you tell students that they that there's a song and there's a little mnemonic device, the more it seems as if those are needed. Like there's no other way to do math without these little songs and mnemonic devices, which is complete bullshit. Right? It's not... Anyway, I'll stop with my philosophy of math. Um, so let's say we have this function here. Uh, oh, what you got, Jeff? So let's take this guy's derivative. really up to you. you so I've seen people do f equals that, g equals that, figure out the derivatives, and then plug it in the form, whatever. Personally, I hate that shit, but you can do it yourself if you want to. I'm going to use the rule top first. All right, so I'm going to take this guy's derivative first times this guy. Minus, leave this guy alone, derivative of what was on the bottom. Is everybody cool so far? So it's top first because the minus should be when you're taking the derivative of the bottom because that's where the negative one power would have been. That's why this rule makes sense. All over x minus one squared. Just the bottom squared. And so what's the derivative of x squared minus four x? Two x minus four. X minus y. Minus, what's the derivative of x minus 1? 1. What's this, what's really saying it's the slope of that line. Right? It's linear, it's easy as shit. One. So then you get x squared. Full squared. 
That's going to be the rest of the class. And we're just doing that. All over. I suppose one squared. Now it's just algebra cleanup shit. So you get 2x squared minus x squared is x squared. Minus 4 minus 2 is minus 6x plus 4x is minus 2x. And then plus 4. Can you factor the top? Can you factor the top? No. Can't, can't find factors of 4 that. At least not a nice one. You factored over the rational stuff. When it comes to interpretation, like on the tests, like how... If you were able to factor this and x minus 1 was a factor, you should reduce it. You will lose, like, a little bit of points, right? If you don't reduce something when you can. This it won't factor. There's no reducing to be done, so you're done. Obviously, where is this not differentiable? And 1 is not even in the domain of the function anyway, so I sort of knew that going in, right? But you can see it's not differentiable because the derivative does not exist at 1. That makes sense. The function doesn't exist at 1. I like it. So, um, do we know the derivative of tangent right now? Some of you guys might but in this class right now, but what we've talked about, no. How could I use what we've learned to figure out what the derivative tangent is? Beautiful. Tangent, sine over cosine. Do it. Figure out what the derivative of tangent is. If you already know, it's not good enough to say it's equal to this. I know what it is. No, do the quotient rule to what it is. done with that, we're going to actually do the quiz, I think. We'll do that. Sorry. My brain was elsewhere. I don't like to do new stuff before a quiz, but it just happens to me. you guys getting here? This will be derivative to the top times the bottom. Derivative of sine x is cosine x. So it'll be cosine times cosine. It's cosine squared. Minus, leave the top alone, derivative of the bottom. What's the derivative of the bottom? And that, of course, at top, under that shit, you should just leave. What's cosine squared plus sine squared? One. And of course, what's one over cosine? Secant. So it would be secant squared. All right. So the derivative of tangent is secant squared. done this before. It's really my fault. I think I just got so excited about shit we were doing, I just kept going. you got to take this quiz, though. Please don't let me throw new stuff in your brain. You could always just, well, isn't there a quiz? No, some of you guys are like, you forget about it. <laughs> but, so you've done it to yourself if you were one of those people. None of this stuff is on here, okay? It's just through two, four. So there are some epsilon delta stuff on here. Oh. 
Um, and you do not need a calculator. So